Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to read Dragons in a Bag by Zeta Elliott. It's illustrated by Geneva B. and published by Random House. I'm gonna pick up where we left off with chapter seven when Jax and Ma were in the guardhouse about to travel using the transporter to get to the place that they would put the dragons. Ma was right. The guardhouse moves through time and space the way the cars on the 90-year-old cyclone rattle around the wooden tracks. My hands reach out for something to hold on to, but the round walls of the guardhouse are smooth. There are no levers to pull or buttons to push. We just swerve and swoop for the longest minute of my life. Are we there yet? I ask breathlessly. Almost, Ma says. Then she leans down and whispers in my ear, you're doing great, Jax. We're gonna land just like an airplane, so brace yourself. When my ears pop, I grab hold of the iron ring on the inside of the back door. It feels like we're actually picking up speed. Hold on, Ma shouts, seconds before we plummet to the ground with a shuddering thud. I swallow hard and take a few deep breaths. You okay, Jax? Ma asks. Her strong hands are still gripping my shoulders, keeping me upright. I open my eyes and the sealed guardhouse is still pitch black. My knees feel a bit wobbly, but I let go of the iron ring and the door. I don't know if I'm okay, but I'm here to help, not to be helped. So I clear my throat and say, ready, Ma, with more confidence than I actually feel. Ma takes her hands off my shoulders. With a grunt, she pushes open the door. It's hot. That's the first thing I notice. And it's dark, even though it doesn't seem to be nighttime. Ma gently pushes me ahead of her, so I'm the first one to step out of the guardhouse. My feet sink into spongy soil and I start to sweat almost right away. It feels just like the inside of the greenhouse at the botanical garden. The plants around us look tropical. It's so humid. Even the leaves are sweating. Strange squawking sounds come from the trees above. I think we're in some sort of jungle. Is this where the dragons live? I ask over my shoulder. The look on Ma's face isn't reassuring. She stands in the doorway of the guardhouse and scowls at the world around us. Ma starts muttering something under her breath. I watch as she runs a finger along the dewy surface of a glossy green leaf. She sticks her finger in her mouth, pulls it out, and concludes, Ain't no magic here. That's not good. We left Brooklyn because there wasn't enough magic there, either. Are you sure, I asked? Maybe we should ask somebody. Ma looks at me sideways. You see anybody around here, Jax? No. But wasn't someone supposed to meet us? That's usually how it works, Ma says. I think we must have overshot the mark. There's no gear shift inside of the guardhouse, but I'm hoping that Ma knows how to put it in reverse. Let's just go back, I suggest. Ma shakes her head. That's the wrong direction. We need to go across, not back. Magic left this earth a long time ago. We won't find it in the past. Can you make the guardhouse go across? Sure, parallel realms exist in different dimensions. Time travel is like whizzing down a slide. Crossing dimensions is more like skipping double dutch. You've got to wait for the right moment and slip in between the ropes. I swat at the biggest mosquito I've ever seen. My clothes are sticking to my skin, but I'll get eaten alive by bugs if I take off my shirt. How do you steer that thing? With my mind, Ma says absently. When it becomes clear she's not going to offer further explanation, I prompt Ma to say more. So you just think about a place and that's where it goes. Pretty much, transporters respond to the intention of the traveler. I sure wasn't thinking about this place. Were you? No. Ma wipes her forehead with the back of her hand. Whew, it's harder, hotter here than Bro Brooklyn in July and twice as humid. Ma reaches up to plump her snowy halo of hair, which is starting to droop a bit. Well, since we're here, we might as well have a look around, she says. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but I trail after Ma as she pushes aside plants with leaves that are bigger than my head. She uses her cane to beat back the dense undergrowth. After a while, the vegetation and the ground below becomes rocky and hard. I'm so busy checking for snakes and other creepy crawlies that I bump into Ma when she stops suddenly. Well now. That's something you don't see every day. I peer around Ma and gasp. We're standing at the edge of a steep cliff and in the distance is an erupting volcano. Dark clouds of ash spew out the top and red lava snakes down the side of the mountain. 
Far below us, I can see creatures fleeing from the eruption, and even from a distance, it's clear that they're dinosaurs. A distant herd, herd of long-necked sauropods doesn't worry me, but then Mob po points to something in the sky, and I look up in time to see a flock of pointy-beaked pteranodons snoring, soaring, over to, soaring overhead. Even though they're high above us, I duck and tug at the belt on Ma's overcoat to pull her back from the edge of the cliff. Maybe we should stay close to the guardhouse, I suggest. Ma opens her purse. The dragons have started to screech and whine, but Ma ignores them and takes out a gold pocket watch instead. She hands me the bag and says, hold this for me while I check our coordinates. You can see there's Ma and Jax and the pteranodons and the erupting volcano and the sauropods. I take the bag from Ma. I thought that was a watch, I say as Mom flips, Ma flips open the gold case. It is, she said, but it's also a compass. Hmm, that's odd. What's odd, I ask anxiously. We seem to have gone back, way back in time. Ma glances at the lush tropical landscape and concludes, this must be the Mesozoic era, Jurassic or Cretaceous period, I'd judge from the flora and the fauna. What do you think, Jax? That's not really my specialty, I say, trying not to think of all the ways that people get eaten in the dinosaur movies I've seen. Why did we land here? I thought we were delivering dragons, not dinosaurs. There are certain similarities between the species, Ma says thoughtfully. But you're right, Jax, this isn't our destination. I didn't intend for us to come here, but Ambrose did say that the transporter was acting up. Ma clicks the compass shut and slips it into her coat pocket. Then she squints at something beyond the edge of the cliff. She points with her cane and asks, You see that? I take a small step forward and crane my neck to see what Ma's pointing at. Something is sparkling on a narrow ledge about five feet below the cliff's edge. Jump down and grab that for me, Jax. I stare at Ma like she's lost her mind. But then I remember that I did sign up to be your helper, so I hand her back her purse and kneel down to get a closer look. I don't know. What is it, I ask. I don't know, Ma replies, but it could come in handy down the road. When I hesitate, Ma adds, the sooner you grab it, the sooner we can get back to the transporter. I scan the red sky for more hungry pteranodon. Then I take off my book bag and take a deep breath and sit down with my legs dangling over the edge of the cliff. I check for footholds and then flip over and start lowering myself down. Ma squats at the cliff's edge, urging me to take my time, but I just want to get this over. Last year, Vic and I got to try rock climbing at our school. We wore harnesses in case we fell, and there were mats on the floor of the gym. I don't have a harness now, and it is a long way down. I focus on making one move at a time, and before long, I'm able to drop onto the ledge. It's just a couple feet to your left, Ma says. There are tufts of vegetation sprouting out of the cliff, and I grab hold of a clump of grass with one hand, and with the other, I reach for the sparkling shard. I tug as hard as I can without losing my balance, but the crystal doesn't come out of the cliff. It's stuck, I tell Ma. She frowns and then lowers her cane so that I can grab a hold of it. Poke it with this, she, she suggests. That might loosen it. I jab the stick at the cluster a couple of times, and sure enough, part of the glittering rock comes loose. I toss the big shard up to Ma. She catches it and then reaches down for the cave. I tuck a smaller fragment of the rock into my pocket and start climbing up the, the rock face. It's easier than going down, and Ma helps me over the edge when I'm within reach. Is that a diamond, I ask once I'm back on my feet. Quartz, Ma says as she examines the hunk of rock. Is it valuable, I ask as I slip my arms to the strap of my book bag. Before Ma can answer, the ground beneath our feet shudders as the volcano belches out more lava and smoke. My eyes grow wide and even Ma looks worried. She slips the shard into her pocket and says, let's go, Jax. Ma doesn't have to tell me twice. I take the lead and plunge back into the jungle, swatting bugs and branches out of my way. Birds in the tree chop screech and I get the feeling that it's not me and Ma that they're worried about. There is something else in the jungle. I can't see it, but I can sense something moving along with us. If it's a dinosaur, I sure hope it's a vegetarian like Triceratops and not a meat eater like T-Rex. I glance over at Ma, but she just yells, keep going. As soon as I see the guardhouse, I dash inside and wait for Ma to join me. She pulls the door open wide, but doesn't come in. Instead, Ma holds her cane before her like a sword and takes a look around. The birds are still making a lot of noise, but whatever was following us seems to have stopped. 
Ma backs towards the guardhouse and then steps inside. We pull the door shut and huddle together, breathing hard into the dark. We wait for the roller coaster ride to start, but nothing happens. I don't know what's worse, landing in the wrong place or going no place at all. Ma? Yes, Jax? Why aren't we moving? Ma sighs heavily. <sighs> I don't know, Jax. I better take a look. You stay here. She shoves open the door of the guardhouse, but I grab hold of her arm. There's something out there. It's okay. I'm a witch, remember? Nobody messes with me. I've got magic on my side. Ma pries her arm free and hands me her purse. Hold this and be ready to go when I give the signal, okay? Then she steps outside and pushes the door shut behind her, leaving it open just enough to let in a sliver of light. I clutch the straps of Ma's purse and think about what should I should do. I won't see any signal if I stay inside this dark guardhouse. And Ma may be a witch, but we still got lost in time, which means that she needs more than magic on her side. I'm just a scared nine-year-old boy, but I came along to help Ma, so I decide that's what I'm going to do. I set Ma's purse on the floor of the guardhouse and push open the heavy black door. What I see surprises me. Ma is sitting on a mossy log with her eyes closed. She looks calm and peaceful like she could doze off right here in the middle of this steamy, scary jungle. Without opening her eyes, Ma starts talking to me. You don't need to be out here, Jax. You just sit tight and I'll try to get us back on track in a minute or two. I'm your helper, I remind her. I can't help you if I'm hiding in the guardhouse. Ma smiles and opens her eyes. True, she says, pointing the spot beside her on the log. And right now I could use all the help I can get. I walk over and sit down next to Ma. Are you tired? I ask her. Ma sighs and rubs her eyes. I've been on the job too long, Jax. These old bones need an extended vacation. Can't you just retire? Sure, but who's going to carry on? I got to think about the future of the profession. Pass the torch, so to speak. I press my lips together and think for a moment. What if Ma were to pass the torch to me? Mama didn't want to be Ma's apprentice, but maybe I could take her place. What about me? I ask. What about you? What if you pass the torch to me? That's sweet of you, Jax, but I don't know if you're cut out for this work. Because I'm a boy? Don't be silly, Ma says with a frown. I just think, well, Jax, you're a lot like your mama. That's true, but maybe that could work to my advantage. Maybe that's a good thing, I tell Ma. After all, Mama's really smart. You said you're so yourself. And she's good at solving problems. Plus, she never gives up, even when bad things happen. Like when my dad died or when the landlord tried to throw us out. So maybe it's a good thing that we're so alike. I'm a quick learner, and I don't mind if things aren't ordinary all the time. Ma's looking at me like she might actually change her mind about training me to become a witch. But then something stirs in the bushes behind us, and I jump in spite of myself. Ma puts a comforting hand on my knee. We'll talk about your qualifications later. Right now, we need to get the transporter up and running, Ma says. I just need a moment to clear my mind. Ma closes her eyes again, but I keep my eyes open in case whatever is moving in the bushes is hungry and sizing me up for a snack. I want to prove to Ma that I would make a good apprentice, but I also want her to hurry up and focus on getting out of here because I'm ready to go now. Whatever's lurking in the bushes behind us starts to growl. I jump up and get ready to run back to the guardhouse, but Ma doesn't budge. Instead, she just reaches her hand inside her coat pocket and clutches the shard of crystal that she put there earlier. Tell me what else you know about Madagascar, Jax. As scared as I am right now, I know what Mom's try Ma's trying to do. She's trying to distract me so I won't start to panic, but it's too late for that. The leafy branches behind Ma start to wave and then snap as the creature prepares to spring from the shadow. Run, Ma, run, I cry as I sprint back to the guards, guardhouse. I'm moving so fast that I slam into the door on the opposite side of the round building. But when I turn around, she's still sitting on the log with her eyes closed. The creature's growl builds up to a full-blown roar and then... Ma's eyes flash open. She pulls a crystal out of her pocket and holds it high above her head. Then she looks straight at me and points the, her cane at the guardhouse. The black door slams shut, leaving me alone in the, gar the dark. Ma? 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 I scream and bang on the door. I lean against it with all my weight, but nothing happens. I turn around and feel along the curved stone wall until I reach the second door. I push as hard as I can, but that door doesn't budge either. I'm trapped inside the guardhouse, which means I'm safe from the beast. But Ma's out there, with only her cane and the crystal to protect her. 
What chance does she stand against a ferocious dinosaur? I turn back to the door that Ma slammed shut, press my ear against it, and try to hear what's going on outside. Over the loud thudding of my racing heart, I hear a strange crackling sound. It gets louder and louder as whatever is making the dro noise draws closer to the guardhouse. Ouch! I jump back as an electric shock makes my ear sizzle. I watch in amazement as blue currents of electricity snake around the doors and along the walls. Then the guardhouse starts to shake. You can see Ma with her cane and the guardhouse and all that electricity. Ma! If I bang on the door, I might get electrocuted, so I just yell Ma's name as loud as I can. When no one answers, I sink to the floor of the guardhouse and bury my face in Ma's purse, even though there's no one here to see me cry. I just want to go home, I whisper through my sobs. The transporter must hear me because it suddenly shoots upward and the roller coaster ride starts all over again. Chapter 8. After a sickening loop to loop, the guardhouse lands with a thud and I lift my head, still clutching Ma's purse. A single blue current of electricity snakes up the door closest to me before fizzling out. I get to my feet and carefully extend a finger to test the door. No shock. I can't tell whether the door faces the street or the park, so I just lean my shoulder against it and push as hard as I can. When the door flies open, I tumble out of the guardhouse and land on a patch of earth that's more mud than grass. I get up and brush myself off and take a moment to look around. I am definitely in Prospect Park, but what year is it? I sigh with relief when a jogger trots past with a smartphone strapped to her arm and wires leading to the buds in her ears. I'm home. Then I look at the dirt path leading into the woods and remember that I left Ma behind in the jungle. My eyes fill with tears again, but I quickly blink them away. I'm Ma's helper and I have to find a way to bring her home too, but I can't do it on my own. Who will help me? I pick Ma's purse up and I close the guardhouse door behind me. My heart leaps when I go around to the front of the guardhouse and find Ambrose sitting on the stone bench. Through mirrored sunglasses, he's watching the sky, which is still overcast, though it's not raining anymore. When pedestrians walk by, Ambrose ducks his head so that the airy space where his face should be is dis disappears from view. I hurry over to the bench, but then freeze when I realize that Ambrose might blame me for what happened to Ma. After all, they've been friends for a really long time. I don't think Ambrose is a witch, but what if he gets angry and refuses to help me? My heart starts to beat fast, making it hard to breathe and speak at the same time. So I plant myself on the, the bench next to Ambrose and I blurt out, Ma's gone, Ambrose. She's gone. Ambrose jumps and shifts on the bench to face me. Whoa, slow down, kid. I take a deep breath, but I can't calm down. Ma's gone, Ambrose. We have to help her. I know Ma's gone. I sent her on her way, remember? I nod and then shake my head and then nod again. Finally, I take a deep breath and try to make more sense. That's not what I mean. I went with Ma to deliver the dragons, but something happened to the transporter. It took us back in time, way back, instead of crossing to another dimension. When we landed, there was no magic, but there were plenty of dinosaurs. One attacked us, and that's when I... I... My voice dwindles to a whisper, and Ambrose has to lean in to hear me confess. I left Ma behind. For a while, Ambrose doesn't say any words. I see my reflection in the mirrored lens of his sunglasses. I look as scared and guilty as I feel. Ambrose finally raises a gloved hand to scratch the place where his chin should be. Hmm, he said thoughtfully. Sounds like you need a guide, someone to steer the ship, so to speak, and it has to be someone who can navigate between dimensions. Another witch? I ask hopefully. Not quite, says Ambrose. But he's the best man for the job. He's the only man for the job, really. So let's hope he's in town. You said there were dinosaurs in this other place? I nod and glance at the harmless pigeons strutting along the sidewalk. It's hard to believe that today's birds are the last of the dinosaurs. We were in a jungle and there was an erupting volcano and I climbed on a cliff to get Ma this sparkling stone. Quartz, she called it. Even though he had no face, somehow I knew that Ambrose was smiling. Ah, quartz. That changes everything. Ambrose points at Ma's purse and asks, what else did she have on her when you got separated? I think for a moment. She had her cane and her pocket watch. That was in her coat pocket. Not fully armored, but well equipped, Ambrose says. Then he asks, you know any dinosaur ex experts? I nod eagerly. My friend Vic knows a lot about dinosaurs, even more than I know. Ambrose sifts through his, through his many pockets before producing two sleek silver phones. 
Here, he says as he offers one to me. You call your people and I'll call mine. That's how we're going to fix this, Jax. Teamwork. I take the phone from Ambrose. It's not locked, so I go ahead and tap out Vic's number. The phone rings several times before Vic's little sister, Katvia, picks up. Is Vic there? I ask her. This is Jackson. I have to talk to him right away. Just a moment, please, Katvia says softly. It feels like forever, but it only takes a few seconds before Vic picks up the phone. Hey, Jax, he says in his usual friendly voice. What's up? Out of habit, I say, not much. But then I remember that there is a lot going on right now. I'm just not sure where or how to begin. Vic makes it easy for you. Where are you? He asks. It sounds kind of loud. Whoever's on the other end of Ambrose's call must have a good sense of humor because he's got Ambrose cracking up. I move a few feet away and say, I'm at Prospect Park, Vic. Can you come out? I really need your help. Like now. Vic doesn't say anything and for a moment I worry that he's going to turn me down. Then I realize that Vic's got his hand over the phone, so I can't hear the conversation he's having with someone else. I could probably sneak out before dinner, but my little sister says that she'll tell on me unless I bring her along. Is that okay? What we really need right now is a grown-up, not a little kid. But Ambrose is still laughing into his phone, so it must mean that he's got another adult lined up to take, Ma to take Ma's place. Sure, Vic, no problem. Can you come right away? I'm at the entrance on Flatbush, across from the Botanic Garden. I know the one, Vic assures me. Be there in 15 minutes, Jax. Thanks, Vic, you're a lifesaver. I hang up and I think about what I just said. Lifesaver. I know, don't know if Ma's life needs saving or what a couple of kids could even do to help her right now. But another burst of laughter from Ambrose gives me hope. He holds the phone to his ear, even though it's covered by the red top pulled over his invisible head. Two baseball caps are stacked on top of that hat and the fedora wobbles on the top as Ambrose laughs. Thanks, man. I've got to go, but I'll tell the kid to wait here for you. What's that? You can't miss him, True. He's got your crazy eyebrows. Ambrose laughs again and ends the call before slipping the phone back into his pocket. I hand him the second phone and he puts it in another pocket before leaning back on the bench. Whew, I think we're set, kid. I called in a favor from an old friend. Name's Troop, and he can't wait to meet you. Why? Is he mad at me? I ask nervously. Mad? Of course not. Matter of fact, Troop's a not-so-distant relation of yours, kid. He'll be happy to see you. There are lots of things that I want to ask about Troop, but I stay settle on the most important question. Will he know how to find Ma? Ambrose nods and manages to catch his fedora before it topples off his head. If she wants to be found, Troop will find a way to reach her. Wants to be found? What do you mean? She's not hiding from us, Ambrose. I left her behind. Tears spring to my eyes, but I manage to stop them from trickling down my cheeks. I can't stop my nose from running, though, so I open Ma's purse and fish around for her packet of tissues. Ambrose uses one of his glove gloved hands to pat me on the back. Don't be so sure. Don't be so hard on yourself, kids. The transporter misfires out again, but Ma does, doesn't make mistakes. Could be all of this is part of her plan. Plan? How could she plan to send me back alone? There were dinosaurs, Ambrose. Real dinosaurs. Ma wouldn't choose to stay behind in a place like that, would she? Hard to say, but if Ma thought that you could do something on your own, she might have sent you back so that she could deal with other matters. I think about that for a moment. Maybe Ma sent me back alone because she trusted me. I do have the dragons after all, and keeping them safe is a big responsibility. But I was supposed to help her, I say meekly. Ambrose chuckles again. You're helping her now, kid. I'm glad Ma's got such a loyal assistant. It's hard to find good help these days. Ambrose heaves himself up off to his feet. Listen, I've got to shut him off, but trouble's on his way. You sit tight and he'll make everything right. Just you wait and see. The man I'm waiting for is called Trouble? I feel like I've had as much trouble as I can handle for one day. But I still thank Ambrose for his help and wave as he pushes his cart away. I hold Ma's purse on my lap and hope that Vic gets here soon. I'm not sure how to tell him about Ma, so I practice telling my story in my head until I see Vic coming up the block holding my sister's hand. I set Ma's back down on the bench and stand up to wave at Vic. His sister has her nose buried in a book, but I still say hi when she's close enough to hear me. Katvia barely glances at me before slipping off her book bag and taking a seat next to Ma's purse on the bench. I recognize Katvia's book bag because Vic had the same one a couple of years ago. It has green plates on it to mimic the spines of a dinosaur. I didn't know that Katvia was also into dinosaur, but two experts are better than one. What's with the bag? Vic asks with a smirk on his face. 
I'm so busy thinking about Coffee's book bag that it takes a second for me to realize that Vic is talking about Ma's purse. It's not mine, I tell him. It belongs to a friend of mine. And she asked you to hold her purse? Vic, Vic asks suspiciously as he looks around for my mysterious friend. Not exactly a reply. This is going to sound crazy, Vic, but I swear everything I'm about to tell you is true. Vic just laughs and says, strange, thing happen strange things happen all the time on my block. I could tell you some stuff you'd find hard to believe. Like what? I ask skeptically. skeptically. Vic glances at his little sister, but she seems absorbed in his book. You know Carlos and Tariq, right? Sure, they're in Mr. Benson's class, I say. Well, a few months ago, they were f fixing up the backyard of this rundown house on Barclay Street, and they found a phoenix. No way. It's true, Vic insisted. We found a picture of it in the Brooklyn Museum. We tried to take care of it, but it was nearing the end of its life, so... Vic looks over at his sister and decides not to finish his sentence. But I need to know the fate of the phoenix. So what happened, I ask him. Vic leans in and says, it went up in flames. But that means a new phoenix was born from the ashes. I haven't seen it yet, but I keep my eyes open just in case. You never know what you might find in Brooklyn. I didn't know what to say. Ma said magic was leaving the city, but maybe she was wrong. Or maybe Ma was right and Vic's baby phoenix had to find somewhere else to live. The best part of Vic's story is that I'd never heard it before, which means that he knows how to keep a secret. So Vic says, what's your unbelievable story? I make sure Katvia is still engrossed in her book. Then I step closer to Vic and says, my friend's missing and she's a witch. Vic doesn't blink, so I go on. She received an important package from Madagascar and instructions to take good care of what was inside. And what was inside? Vic asks. Three dragons. This time Vic's eyes grow wide. Actual dragons? I nod, but then confess. Well, I haven't seen them, but that's what Ma said. She saw them? Not exactly. Ma kept them in the dark because there's this thing called imprinting. Vic nods like he doesn't need an explanation. And your friend didn't want the dragons to get attached to a human. Smart move. So where are the dragons now? I point at Ma's bag over on the bench. And my heart skips a beat. The first thing I notice is that Katvia is no longer reading her book. The second thing I notice is that the familiar mint t t tin is open on her lap. No, I cried. But it's too late. Not only are there three tiny dragons peering out of the tin, but but Kavita is feeding them. Let's see. You can see she's got the dragons and she's feeding them. Kavi, what are you doing? Vic asks. Sharing my snack, she replies without even looking at her brother. Vic and I draw closer to get a better look at the dragons. They're so tiny that they must have had plenty of room inside of Ma's mint tin. Two of wings and one has a long body with plates along its curved spine. All of them have purpley scales that shimmer like the feathers that circle the necks of the strutting pigeons. The dragons look harmless and they purr happily as they eat crumbs Kavita is sharing with them. I pointed the plastic sandwich bag on Kavita's lap. Inside there are two round ivory colored cakes. One is whole and the other has been broken into little pieces by Kavita so she can feed the hungry dragons. I remember what Ma said about not giving the dragons marshmallows. What's in the bag? I asked anxiously. That's Pita. Vic explains. My auntie brought it from her shop in Queens. I've never heard of it before, but the dragons can't get enough of it. Kavita laughs as they nip at her fingers and jostle for more. Ma says that newborn dragons love st sticky sweet things, I tell Vic. Then they'll love Peter, she says. It's made from milk, sugar, and cardamom. Vic reaches into his sister's bag and takes out the cake that's still whole. A sliced green pistachio nut has been pressed into its center. Vic breaks the cake and hands half to me. Try it. Vic pops his half of the pita into his mouth. I take a small bite at first, but quickly cram the rest of my mouth. It's so good. For a moment, none of us say a word as we savor this sweet, creamy cake. But as the sugary treat dissolves, I realize that we have an even bigger problem. The dragons are gazing up at Kavita with adoration. And I could be wrong, but it looks like they're a little bit bigger than they were just five minutes ago. I don't want to go off and on a little girl, so I start with a simple question. Hey, Kavi, how did you find the dragons? I ask. 
I needed a napkin, so I looked in your purse. It's not my purse, I tell her. It belongs to Ma. Kev Kavi rolls her eyes and says, whatever. I was looking in your mom's purse when I heard something crying. So I, dragons don't cry, Vic says irritably. How do you know, Kavita? Kavita asks in a voice that sounds just as annoyed. They sounded sad, so I opened up the tin and gave him some of my snack. I look at Vic and he looks at me before sighing heavily. I'm guessing this isn't the first time his little sister has caused so much trouble. She might be faking it, but Kavita, Kavita gives us an innocent look and says, What's the big idea? You had no right to poke, poke around in Jackson's purse, Vic says angrily. It's not my purse, I remind him. Well, that's right. It belongs to a witch, Vic hisses the last word, and Kavita's eyes grow wide. But you meddled with her dragons, and now they think that you are, her, her, are their mother, Vic tells her. I don't mind, Kavita says while stroking the little wingless dragon under its chin. The two winged dragons get jealous and clamor for her attention, rubbing against her arm like cats. I mind, I exclaim. Then I look around at the people going in and out of the park and realize they need to keep it down. Those dragons aren't supposed to be here, I tell Kavi. We're supposed to be delivering them to someone else, but now you've ruined everything. If Kavita feels bad about what she's done, she sure doesn't show it. Vic picks up the red tin and holds out his palm. Put them back in, Kavi. Now, he demands. Kavita frowns. They don't want to stay inside that horrible little tin. It doesn't matter what they want, I cry. They need to stay hidden until we can find Ma and deliver them to the right dimension. Just put them back, Kavi, or I'll tell Mummy that you are going through a stranger's bag. You can see Kavita with the dragons. That works. Kavi puts all three dragons in her palm and lifts them to her mouth to give each one a kiss. Then she sets them in the tin one by one. But when Vic tries to close the lid, the dragons screech and howl like they're in pain. I snatch the tin from Vic and try to force it shut. Stop, you're hurting them, Kavita cries. Vic sighs and says to me, I think you're going to need a, a bigger tin, Jax. And he's right. Just a few crumbs of pita has led to a dragon growth spurt. We're going to be needing a larger container. What about the plastic bag? Let's put them in there for now and zip it up. Vic grabs the bag with a leftover pita from his sister's lap. He takes out the crumbling cake and offers it to me. I shove it in my mouth and then dump all three dragons from the tin into the little bag. But as soon as they start eating the crumbs sticking to the bottom of the bag, their scaly, writhing bodies start to grow some more. Ouch! Vic cries before dro dropping the bag on the ground. I snatch it up from the ground, and I see that one corner of the plastic bag is melted. Uh-oh, I say. I think these are fire-breathing dragons. I unzip the bag, and a wisp of smoke rises from the mouth of the wingless dragon. We need something fireproof, Vic suggests. I might have something at home. I shake my head and watch the dragons as they flick their forked pink tongues over the few pita crumbs left in the plastic bag. I don't have time. Trouble's on his way. Vic gives me a funny look. Trouble? That's Ma's replacement, I tell him. You and your sister don't have to say, Vic. I honestly don't know what's going to happen next. Vic puts a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Well, we'll wait with you until you find out. What will you do with the dragons? Kavita asks as she gets up from the bench the bench that's up to, to drag it uh, that's up to jackson not you Vic snaps at his sister you need to learn to mind your own business kavi kavi turns away in a huff and unzips her own bag to place her book inside i take ma's purse and search inside for another container when i can't find a suitable replacement for the mint tins i unzip a side pocket and put the sandwich back inside then i close up the side pocket and click the latch that holds Ma, ma's purse closed Sorry about my sister, Vic says. I should have kept a closer eye on her. I turn around and shrug wearily. Don't worry, Vic. It's been kind of a crazy day, I tell him. I look up the block and I see a tall man with a bushy gray beard and furry gray eyebrows coming our way. And it's not over yet. The tall man holds out his hand before reaching us. But with three long strides, he's standing right in front of me. You must be Jax, he says, with a big smile that reveals a golden tooth. I'm Charlie Randall, but my friends call me Trub. Chapter 9. Who do we have here? Trub asks. I notice that his eyes gleam along with his gold tooth whenever he smiles. This is my friend Vic and his sister Katvia. Kavita. Um, Trub shakes both their hands and then points to the bench and says, Why don't we sit down? I can think on my few feet, but we can make a better plan if we put our heads together. 
I sit down first. Trump sits on one side of me and Vic sits on the other. Kavita holds Miles' purse in her lap and sits on the far end of the bench. I notice that she leaves a lot of space between herself and her brother. So, Trump says as he rubs his hand together, what can I do for you, Jax? I know that it's rude to stare, but I can't stop looking at Trub's bushy eyebrows. The gray and white hairs far outnumber the black ones, but there's no denying his eyebrows look a lot like mine. I want to ask him how we're related, but first I need to answer his question. Ambrose said that you could navigate between dimensions. Ma tried to do it, but something went wrong with a transporter. I point to the guardhouse behind us, and Trub nods like he understands. What's a transporter? Kavi asks, but Vic stresses his sister. Mind your business, Kavi. She sulks and turns away from us while I finish telling my story to Trub. Vic listens closely but doesn't say a word. When I reach the end, Trub strokes his bushy beard and thinks for a moment. So there are two things that we have to do. Deliver the dragons and find Ma. Which one do you want to do first? Find Ma, I say without hesitation. When I left her, she was in, an, in trouble. Ma's got a nose for trouble, he says with a chuckle. That's how she found me. Of course, there are different kinds of trouble. What's Ma up against this time? A dinosaur, I think. Vic grabs my arm. A real dinosaur? I understand Vic's excitement, but this isn't a story I'm proud to share. There was something moving in, in the jungle following us. As it was about to attack, Ma sent me back, alone. I don't suppose you two figured out where you were in time, Trump says doubtfully. I think back to what Ma said when she uh, checked her compass. Ma thought it was the Mesozoic era. Triassic period? Vic asked. Jurassic, maybe. What kind of creatures did you see? Treb asked. I wasn't trying to get up and close with and personal with anything in that world, but there were pteranodons flying in the, the sky, I tell him. They lived from the late Triassic to the Cretaceous period, though technically they're not dinosaurs, Kavita says in a know-it-all sort of way. They're flying lizards, Vic explains. Lizards? I think for a moment, and then I slip off my book bag. I pull out El Roy's massive book and show it to Trub. Ma loaned me this. This man who wrote is the one who sent the dragons from Madagascar. Trub takes the book from me and opens it up. El Roy Jenkins. I haven't heard that name in a while. I thought he was in Australia, not Africa. Vic checks his watch and stands up. I wish we could stick around, Jax, but it's almost time for dinner. Maybe we better head home. Is there anything else we need? Just one more thing, Vic. How long did Pteranodons stick around before they went extinct? Over a hundred million years, Katvia replies, even though I wasn't asking her. I check with Trub, who shakes his head. Thanks for coming out, Vic, I say. Anytime, Jax. I hope you find your ma. Let's go, Kavita. Vic's little sister gets up from the bench and reluctantly hands over Ma's purse. Vic nudges her and says, Kat Kavita wants to tell you something, Jax. I look at her for a long time, but she doesn't say a word. Vic nudges her again, harder this time. Kavita sighs and looks at her sh shoes. Sorry about what happened before, she says quietly. I feel kind of bad for yelling at her, so I said, don't worry about it. And thanks for sharing your snack with all of us. Kavita smiles and then takes her brother's hand. I watch as they walk down a block, the fabric plates on Kavita's dinosaur bag flapping in the wind. I figure Trub and I will get back in the transporter, but he surprises me by asking, you hungry? I haven't had anything to eat since choking down that peanut butter sandwich that Ma made for me this morning. I want to say yes, but it feels wrong to put my stomach ahead of Ma. Yeah, but shouldn't we get back to Ma? I ask uneasily. Trouble puts his hand on my shoulder and looks me square in the eye. Ma's going to be all right, son. I know this business is new and strange to you, but I've been doing it off and on for 20 years. And if there's one thing that I know for sure, it's that Ma can take care of herself. I think back to the moment of the jungle when Ma pointed her cane at the guardhouse. Before the door closed, Ma's eyes had locked on mine. Even with that wild creature charging her, Ma didn't look afraid. Ambrose thinks that Ma sent me back on purpose, I tell Trub. Of course she did, he replied. Ma ain't perfect, but she also don't make no mistakes, if you know what I mean. I didn't, but I nodded anyway, and Trub went on. Could be she sent you back for a reason. Maybe to meet me, Trub laughs, and his golden tooth catches the sun which is finally starting to come out. One thing I know for sure is that we can't work on empty stomach. Let's go grab a burger to go, Trub says. We can even eat it on the way if you like. I imagined myself trying to eat while swooping and swerving inside the transporter. Then I pictured myself puking all over Trub in the cramped guardhouse. Maybe we should eat first, I suggest. Trub nods and steers me up the block with his hand still on my shoulder. 
Mama doesn't usually let me eat fast food, but there's a burger joint right across the street and that's where we're heading. I walk alongside Trub, wanting to ask a dozen questions but not knowing where to start. Ambrose says that we're related, I say shyly as we wait for the light to change. That's right, Trub says with his gold tooth smile. I've wanted to do this for years. Do what, I ask. Take my grandson out for a burger. The light changes, but I don't step off the curb. Instead, I turn to look at Trub. There's definitely a strong resemblance, but if he really is my grandfather, why hasn't Mama ever mentioned him to me? After my daddy died, Mama said it made it seem like it was just the two of us against the world. I always figured that Ma was such a good mo mother because her own parents weren't there for her when she was my age. If she couldn't count on her father back then, why should I trust him now? Trub watches me as if he can see all the questions swirling in my mind. He smiles and gives my shoulder another squeeze. I'm sure I am glad to see you, son, though I wish we could have met under different circumstances. You probably got a lot of questions for me, so how about we get some grub and then start catching up? That sounds like a reasonable plan, so I save my question until we're back on the stone bench in front of the guardhouse, eating greasy burgers and fries. So, where have you been? I mean, Mama never told me I had a grandfather living in Brooklyn. Trump takes a long sip of a soda and then rattles the ice left in the cup. Well, I can't say I blame her. I've been in and out of the city for the past 20 years. A rolling stone, if you know what I mean. I don't, but I solved the riddle myself instead of asking Trub for an explanation. Stones don't usually roll, so I figured Trub must mean that he wasn't around much when Ma was young. I pretty much knew that already, so I move on to my next question. Are you like a witch or like a warlock? Trub shakes his head and brushes crumbs out of his beard. I ain't got no particular kind of training, nothing formal at least. No training means no title, but that doesn't bother me. I just help out wherever and whenever I can. Ma, she calls me Trouble Man. Or Trub for short. Is that because you get into trouble a lot, I ask? Trub doesn't answer right away. He balls up the foil wrapper from his burger and stuffs it inside the grief-stained paper bag that's between us on the bench. Well, Jax, he says finally, sometimes I find trouble and sometimes trouble finds me. I expect Trub to smile or wink at me like he usually does, but this time my grandfather just sighs. There's a song by the same name. Don't suppose you've ever heard of it. Came out long before your time. How's it go? Trub crumples up the bag of trash and aims for a garbage can a few few feet away. He makes the shot, but Trub still doesn't smile. It's by a great musician named Marvin Gaye. He was very talented, but also very troubled. In his song, he says there's only three things that's for sure. Taxes, death, and trouble. I suck the last of my soda through the straw. Then I burp and say, that sounds like a really depressing song. Trub smiles. It's got a good beat. You like jazz? I shrug. I think my daddy used to listen to jazz records, but Mama doesn't play them anymore. Trub says, one of these days, I'll play a song for you. That song might sound depressing, but really it's about not letting life get you down. I nod and gather up what's left of my meal. My aim's not that great, so I carried over the trash can, but before I can get there, the biggest rat I've ever seen scurries across my path. I holler and I jump back. The rat's heading straight for Trub, but he doesn't seem concerned. In fact, he pats the spot where I was sitting on the bench, and he grins when the rat hops up and puts its front paws on his leg. You can see Trub, and Jax, and that rat. There are plenty of rats in Brooklyn. They're dirty and nasty and carry disease. Remember the plague? So I definitely keep my distance. I'm expecting this giant rat to take a big bite out of my grandfather's leg, but instead he asks, hey, Drub, got any grub? You're too late, Nate, grub's gone. Where you been? The rat puts one paw on his hip and looks like he's ready to tell Trub a long story till he sees me, or rather the uneaten food in my hand. Hey, kid, the rat calls out, you gonna eat that? I shake my head and I set my leftovers on the ground. I barely have time to pull my hand away before Nate hops off the bench and starts devouring my cold fries. When a hungry pigeon starts to steal a bit of hamburger bun smeared with ketchup, Nate rushes at the poor bird and sends it squawking. I slip back on the bench and ask, friend of yours? Trub nods and says, me and Nate go way back. He's no ordinary rat. I watch the rat greedily gobb gobbling down my leftovers and try to see what makes Nate so special. Trub can tell that I'm not impressed. Nate's got a nose like no other, he explains. All rats can sniff out food, but Nate... Trub pauses to beam at his rodent friend. Nate's got a nose for magic. Magic is a smell? 
Nate stops eating and looks over at me. Everyone, th everything has a smell, kid. Magic, joy, fear, regret. All of it can be detected if you've got the right nose. He taps his snout with one claw before rising up on his haunches to sniff the air. What do you smell, Nate? Treb asks. The rat turns away from us and sniffs again. Strange. There's a trace of envy in the air. It's something else. Nate sniffs again and then looks at us. I smell a thief, he says in a grave voice. I tighten my hold on Ma's purse and glance around nervously. Treb frowns. Close by, he asks. Nate shakes his head, stroked his whiskers. Long gone. Then he grins and rubs his paw together. But I do love a challenge. Gotta run, Treb. Thanks for the dinner, kid. Nate scurries away to the curb and disappears inside the sewer. Did he really smell a thief down there, I ask Treb? He nods and gets to his feet. I pick up my trash off the ground and place it in the can. When I turn around, Treb surprises me by saying, when Nate said that he could smell regret, he was talking about me. What do you regret, I ask? So many things, Treb says, slowly shaking his head. I sure was sorry to hear about your daddy, Jax. My cheeks start to burn and suddenly I want nothing more than to be squeezed inside the dark guardhouse, hurtling through time. I stand before Treb with my eyes glued to the ground. He reaches out a hand gently and runs his thumb along my eyebrows, the way that Mama does sometimes. I look at my grandfather and I ask, how did you find out? I may not be around all the time, but I've always kept tabs on you and your Mama. You weren't at the funeral, I say softly, hoping to hide the accusation in my heart. I was there, but I thought it was the best it was best for me to keep a low profile. A funeral really isn't the time for a family reunion. And the last time we talked, her mama made it clear that she didn't want me interfering in her life. Mama said that? Treb nods. It was over ten years ago before you were born. Can't say I blame her. You see, I couldn't always find study work when your mom was a little girl. That meant that she had to go with some without some things sometimes. Plus, I had some buddies who were kind of shady, and I got mixed up in some of their mess. But when Ma introduced me to the realm of magic, everything changed. For the first time in my life, I really felt like I belonged. I was useful again. Ma believed in me, and that made it easy just to believe in myself. I thought that I could just wrap that world up in a rainbow and give it to Alicia. But she didn't want no part of it, or me after that. If you knew Mama didn't like magic, why did you leave her with Ma? I didn't, but my wife, your granny... She got the wrong end of the stick when it came to me and Ma, so she dropped Alicia right in the middle of it. Some folks fear magic, Jax, black magic especially, but in the other realm there is no black or white. There's less fear and more wonder. Trump smiles at himself. I thought my little girl could be like the girl in that book, Alicia in Wonderland. But I was wrong. My baby girl didn't see all the beauty, just the strangeness. I feel like Trub's talking in riddles again. This time I ask for help. Wait a minute. Are you saying you took Mama to another dimension when she was little? Trub nods. Just once, but that once was all it took. She took a look around, shut her eyes as tightly as she could, and demanded that I take her back home. I can't wait to see the realm of magic. At least I'm curious about what it's like. It's hard to imagine my brave mother being so scared. But then I remembered how terrified I was when Ma accidentally took me to the land of dinosaurs. If the magic realm had dragons, maybe Mama felt the same way. Trub looks pretty miserable, so I try to think of something that will make him feel better. Ma says that Mama just wanted to be ordinary, I tell Trub. He nods as if that makes sense to him. Maybe so. What about you, Jax? What do you want? I think for a moment. Does Trub know that Mama and I are about to lose our homes? Would he approve if I told him that I wanted to become Mom Ma's apprentice? I don't know the answer to those questions, so I just say... I want to find Ma and make sure she's okay, and then I want to help her deliver the dragons. Treb claps his hands together and gets up from the bench. Then that's what we'd better do. You ready to go? I nod and I hold Ma's purse close to my chest. It feels lighter than before, but then I realize what's missing. I don't have Ma's compass, I tell Treb. She had it on her when we got separated. That's good. She'll need it to find her way around, he says. Treb reaches into his pants pocket and pulls out a silver watch. I got my own, so if you've got the dragons, we're all set. We're missing something else, though. I scan the street for a scruffy homeless man pushing an overflowing grocery cart. Don't we need Ambrose to open the door, I ask? Trub winks at me and his gold tooth flashes between his smiling lips. As it happens, picking locks is one of my specialties. That's where we're going to stop today. We'll pick up with chapter 10 tomorrow. We're reading Dragons in a Bag by Zeta Elliott, illustrated by Geneva B, and published by Random House. 
Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.